Bye. 
Grazie. 
And thus, if he has reason to boast of anything, it will be on his own account, not on another's. And each one will bear his own responsibility. He who is instructed in the word should share with his instructor all his goods. Make no mistake about it. God is not made a fool. A man will surely reap whatever he sows. If he sows in the flesh of the field, he will reap from it a harvest of corruption. But if his seed ground ground is in the spirit, from the spirit he will reap everlasting life. Let us not grow weary of doing good, for if we do not relax our efforts, in due time we shall reap our harvest. So while we have the opportunity, let us do good to all men, but especially to those who belong to the household of the faith. Here hand is the lesson. Deo gracias.
Sancti, Evangelii secundum Luca. Gloria Sibri Domine. At that time, Jesus went to a town called Nain. His disciples and a large crowd accompanied him. As he approached the gate of the town, a man who had died was being carried out, an only son of a widowed mother. And a good-sized crowd of townsfolk were with her. And the Lord, seeing her, was moved with pity for her and said to her, Do not lament. Then he stepped forward and touched the stretcher, and the bearers halted. <coughs> and he said, Young man, I bid you rise up. The dead man sat up and began to speak. Then Jesus gave him back to his mother. Fear seized them all, and they began to praise God. A great prophet, they said, has arisen among us, and God has visited his people. The Gospel of the Lord. Last be
morning. Good morning. We greet you on this beautiful, beautiful day. <coughs> In the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, on this 15th Sunday after Pentecost. In today's Mass, there's a dominant thought that's so often repeated in the liturgy and so dear to each and every one of us. Christ is our life. Whatever good there is in us is because of his grace, by which we remain steadfast and good. By his grace we rise from sin, and in eating his flesh, we nourish his life within us. Without Christ, we would abide in death. And without him, we could never live the glorious life of the spirit described by St. Paul in today's epistle. A couple Sundays ago, we were told that we should walk in the spirit. It would be well to take a few thoughts from this. Let us not be made desirous of vain glory, provoking one another. For if any man or woman thinks of him or herself to be something, whereas he or she is nothing, that person deceives themselves. True humility is presented here as a basis of fraternal love. Anyone who is proud carries with him or her a hotbed of discord for preferring himself to others. He or she will often be provocative and envious and haughty and disdainful of those whom he or she considers as inferior. If a man be overtaken in any fault, you who are spiritual, instruct him in the spirit of meekness. One who wishes to scale the heights must never be critical of the one who has not reached that height, nor be scandalized at the faults of another. If duty requires us to admonish anyone, if we should correct anyone, and the Bible said that we should correct each other, then we should do it in kindness. <clears throat> this is the fruit of humility, because when we correct others, we should also take heed to correct ourselves. Amen? Amen. Amen. The thought that Jesus is our life shines forth in our gospel today. For Jesus meets the sad funeral procession of a young man. And we're told that his mother is walking beside the bier. <coughs> and she's weeping. And the Lord, seeing her, had compassion on her and said to her, Lament not, meaning weep not. And he came near and touched the beard. And he said, young man, I say to thee, arise. And he gave him to his mother. Oftentimes, we are dead. I know you say you're alive, but we're dead when we commit <coughs> mortal sin. Yes. We're dead the gospel of Christ. St. Augustine and many other saints have been restored to life. And if the saints who led lives of innocence attract us so much, those who were brought back from sin have still greater power. And I want you to know that the uh, saints did not always walk around with their hands folded and being meek and humble. They had to go through the challenges of life. They had to fight mortal sin in their lives. And we should do likewise. 
Whenever we find ourselves in sin, we know that the Lord has left provisions for us. We can confess our sins and thus gain forgiveness. So the way he commanded that the dead young man arise, he tells us to arise after we have confessed our sins. And to shift gears a little bit today, I'd like to talk to you about a few things. You know, the science of ophthalmology offers members of the faith an interesting way of understanding the state of the vision in the church. There are two basic eyesight conditions that most of us know well. There are many, many eye conditions, but we know these two well. The first one is farsightedness. And the other is nearsightedness. <coughs> Farsightedness is the condition where, to be as simplistic as possible, people can see far away but have difficulty with things that are close by. They wear glasses to read and to clearly see things that are within a few feet of their eyes. Whereby nearsightedness is the reverse. Nearsighted people can see things that are right in front of them clearly, but they have difficulty focusing on things at a distance. They are well what is, what is close, at, they, they see well those things that are close at hand, but they cannot see with the same clarity things that are far off. Now, transferring this terminology to the realm of religion, the church can be said to be suffering from a spiritual nearsightedness. We can see things up close and dissect them to the most minute part. But we have a problem looking to the horizon and seeing what God is calling for in the days that are to come. We are good at the now, but most of us have not mastered the not yet. We cannot see that far and cannot focus on that distant picture. We cannot conceive where we ought to be going. And this is true not only of the church, it is also true of church folk. We can see clearly where we are. We understand our present position, but we have a hard time looking into the future and seeing what will unfold for us. And even if we see it, we seldom embrace it. We have a hard time believing that it will happen for us Yet the future is not only waiting for us, it is calling us. It is summering <clears throat> us to step up and start to make it happen. Church, we need true vision correction. We require spiritual laser surgery in order to see properly. God has so much in store for us. We live our lives and plot our courses in the 21st century. He has great things planned and prepared for us. It is, however, essential that we believe in and head in that direction. The church and Christians must believe that we have entered a season of unparalleled challenge. But we must trust God that the future does indeed belong to us. And not putting up obstacles when our leader tells us about the vision that he has. God wants us to look to the future and believe what is awaiting us. He wants us to see the challenges he is laying out for us and the blessings that are in our, in our wake. 
their service in the future. But there is also a shout. There is work, but there is also witness. There is much to be accomplished, but there is great rejoicing. What Almighty God wants us to do is to move beyond our encumbrances and have a vision of things to come. A definitive text regarding the nature of vision is found in the book of Revelation. If anyone thinks that the revelation of John was written from the comfort of a couch while enjoying magic moments of life, that person is sadly mistaken. This is not the fruit of meditation or an intentional manuscript written on a ministerial retreat. It is the work of a man who thought that his future was bleak and that the future was without hope. John was exiled to the lonely, crag craggy island of Patmos, a place reserved for those whose days were numbered. John is away from the fire of the faith. His preaching had ended. His leading of the worship services were over. His fellowship with the people of God had been terminated. And church, this is his lot. This is his plight. This is his life. What is so interesting is the fact that it is from Patmos that John receives the revelation, this apocalyptic message of the future of humanity and God's role in that future. It is from Patmos where the future is bleak that we receive the revelation of a future that is glorious, one that is enchanted, inspiring. We need not count out Patmos moments. They may be the very events that gives us the revelation we need. That's the way God works. In this instance, using the least likely places and the least likely people to put us in line for what he has for us. But in our century, he has made provisions for us. He has given us leaders. And that which comes with the leader is vision, which he shares with us. But the vision cannot come to fruition unless the rest of the body is in accord. Amen? Amen. For examples from scripture, we need Look no further than the book of Ezekiel, who was sitting with the other exiles by the river Chabar, when God gave him a vision and called him into the greatest service. When we look at Elijah, who was the prophet of God, was in a cave in Mount Horeb, bemoaning his plight and feeling sorry for himself. Or a glorious moment of history. And victory had turned into a time of great despair. His heart was broken and his spirit was heavy. He was ready to give up. And he left Samaria. He traveled far to reach Horeb. And when he was in a state of deep depression, God spoke to him. He didn't speak in a loud voice, but in a still, small voice. And when Elijah left Horeb, he left on fire. The fire never failed again. The church, it is in the lonely places that give birth to great visions. It's in the place of abandonment that we find the vision of fellowship. When we are at our lowest end, God takes up to his eyes. 
Now John on the island for his defense of the faith. And now God opens the curtains of heaven's uh, theater and allows John to see how it shall end. The scriptures tells us that he sees a new heaven and a new earth. He sees the redemption of all that has been corrupted. He sees a glorious new world for those who love the Lord. He sees his labor's reward. He sees the fruit of his efforts. He realizes there, that there is no need to be weary in doing. For in due season we shall reap if we faint not. He sees the old order pass away and a new order emerge. It will come because, like him, fight to make it happen and do not surrender in spite of all of the obstacles in their way. And God lets John see what will come to pass and how his suffering shall be vindicated. In theology, we call this apocalyptic. John just calls it a vision. He saw something that made his spirit come alive, that resuscitated his failing and faltering hope and caused him once again to be encouraged. In church, as Christians, we should always be encouraged. It is vision that keeps us going, for the word of God says it is best, says it best in Proverbs, where there is no vision, the people perish. It is vision that makes us take up new challenges and struggle against oppressive forces. The vision of a society not marked by the differences of race and gender has been the driving force behind the civil rights movements that have brought us breakthroughs such as equal housing and the voting rights bill. The vision of the home, the children, and college, the mission assignment, the new church, the choir concert, the baby's birth, the day of graduation. These are all part of God's great drama of redemption. We must see beyond the horizon and the day-to-day -day struggles and situations must yield to a higher vision of the future where there is victory and success. We need to stop complaining about what we can't do and focus on what we can do. Vision is not taught in schools. It is not in the university. It is not an underlying and undergirding force that moves history. Church, we are on our way somewhere. And we, the people of faith, know that somewhere to be the dwelling place of Almighty God. We are on our way to the end of history and the fulfillment of eternity. We are on our way back to Eden. Paradise lost will be paradise regained. This is the Christian hope and calling. This is the provision that propelled the people of God. Vision is for the mother who is beset by circumstances of life. Vision is for the father who feels as if life only makes demands and offers little in return. Vision is for that youngster who is struggling to maintain a sense of sanity while living in a situation marked by chaos and confusion. Vision opens locked doors and revives the creative spirit. It makes us feel as if we can take on life and this time come out victorious. Just because we have accomplished one vision doesn't mean we stop there. We continue on because there are new horizons as we continue on this journey for the Lord. God's steadfast promise to us is that he will provide a vision for the future. And he does not just dry our eyes and calm our fears. He does not just provide food and shelter. 
He does not just raise up friends. He also provides vision. He shows us what we need to see. He gives us a glimpse of those things that are to come. And he gives us a view of a better day, a brighter horizon, and a blessed fulfillment. God gives to each of us a piece of his cosmic picture. He gives us a slice of the grand plan and says, go for it. <clears throat> we see as vision, as vision is in God's eternity already a reality. He has not only de designed the plan in his eternity, he has executed it. He shows us what is to come for us, but it has already happened for him. We wonder if, and God knows it shall. <clears throat> God gives us vision to motivate us toward the desired end. He lets us peek at the end of the chapter, at the last page then rise to make it happen. God is offering a future and it has his blessings on it. And any person that expects a straight line from vision to victory is mistaken. The adversary, the prince of darkness, the deceiver of the brethren, waits at every turn to Avert the plan that God has for our lives. Just because we have obtained this building does not mean that there aren't, aren't any more visions to come. God attempts to frighten us by, by presenting strong opposition. Not, excuse me, we, uh, we are frightened by Satan because he always puts the obstacles in our way and says, we can't do this. We can't do that. Satan is always on the job. He is there to be the deceiver and the discourager. He is out to test and prove our metal and to see us do as Adam and Eve did, fall away from our destiny. He takes his time to make us feel as if the vision will not come to pass. How do you think that we have come thus far along these pilgrim ways without a God blessing us every day, telling us that you can do it, go for it. But what we receive as vision has already been completed in God's reality. God gives us a vision surrounded by his promise and protection. But as that vision enters the realm of our reality, it is attacked by the realities of the world. And the adversary adds the burden to the blessing. Many of us have had this happen to us. We knew what God had planned for us. We knew the outcome, but something came along to put us in a tailspin. Oh, how many times has that happened to us? That something is the work of the devil and his aim to throw us off course. And we need to take heed and remember that he's always around, looking for every opportunity that he can get to make us say we can't do it. We become bound by our history, afraid of our past and well aware of our previous mistakes. But God has considered that all has, is going to be all right. Many of the Lord's people are just going through the motions of living. They want better and, and, and wish for better. But they are afraid to envision better. They keep their dreams like novels that are very good to read and have no basis in reality. They know that the scriptures declare in Mark that everything is possible for him who believes. 
You know, we read all of this in the scriptures, but do we take heed? God says everything is possible for him or her who believes, but actually believing is another matter, amen? amen. amen. We better stop just reading. And, 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 and said, oh, that's nice. We better apply what we read to our lives. I was talking to my grandson last night, telling him about life in general. And when I realized I had been speaking for about a half hour and went into a, a, a sermon. <laughs> for so many, life has depleted our energy energy to such an extent that we often fear that we will not hold up under the strain. We have been so battered by the pressures of life that we abandon the hope and the vision simply because it feels safer. Church, we cannot afford to always feel safe. We have to step out and stretch out on faith in God. We feel as if we too are on the island of Patmos. We feel as if our lives are empty and without purpose or plan. We feel as if we have been relegated to the loneliest areas of life and are being forced to endure it alone. We do not dream because we believe that dreams don't come true. But I want you to know, church, that God has empowered us to go through whatever obstacles that are placed in our paths and attain the vision that he has given our leader who has passed it on to us. God strengthens us to endure and to hold out. No force is strong enough to break the grip that he has on our lives. And in conclusion, I say that let us be aware <coughs> of the vision that our leader shares with us. Let us stop saying that we can't. For the word of God tells us that if you are a true believer, you will know that God can do anything but fail. And I don't know why the Spirit of the Lord <clears throat> referred me to that particular passage in the scriptures. But I knew that I, it had an impact on me. And that we must respond to the vision that, of the leader that God has given us. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit.
Hook is to end Gordon's name. Hik est an Kalik Sandis, Novia Thirty Testament, Mysterium Fidei, Qui pro volumis et pro multis in fundage, in remission peccatorum. Amen. Jaime Escudavira, John Camper, Clarence Smith, Elizabeth Mosley, Howard Mosley, <coughs> Juanita Jackson.
Calypsum et cum ipso et in ipso et stibi Deo Patri Omnipotenti in unitati Spiritus Sancti Omnes Honor et Gloria. Ben omnia secula, secula rum. Amen. Oremus. Precepida salutaribus modniti, et divina institutione formati, audemos dicere. Pater Noster, qui es in celis, sancti vicetur nomen tuam. Adveniat regnum tuam, fiat voluntas tuam, sicur et in cielo ed in terra. Panem nostrum quotidianum da nobis hotie et dimiti nobis debita nostra sicur et nos dimitimus Debitaribus nostri, et ne nos inducas in tentationem. Selegra nos amano. Per omnia secula seculorum. Amen. Pax Domini sit semper vorbiscum. Ecum spiritu tu.
Domine non sin dignus, ut in stress protecti meum, sententum de diverbo est nadver anua me. Domine non sin dignus, ut in stress protecti meum, sententum de verbo est sanabit ater anua me. Domine non sin dignus, ut in stress protecti meum, sententum de verbo est nadver anua me. Corpus Domini, Nostri Jesu Christi, Pastoris Amen, and to all men to my channel. Video de onipotenti, the Adamarium Semper Virgin, the Adamarium of Angel, the Adiwan of Baptista, Santos Apostolis Petro and Paolo, Onibus Santos, Pater and TCA, we were governing this cause of us in the verbal and the good air. Mea Corpa, Mea Corpa, Mea Maxima Corpa, Leo Recorpi Adamarium Semper Virgin. We are the Magia Magandu, we are the Juan and Baptista, Santos of Rosalos, Petro and Paolo, on the Santos, Father and Tissime, or are they from the Adam of the Ambassador? The rest will be entreated all this omnipotence and misericordious darkness. Amen. Ece Agnus Dei, Ece Tritone, Vicat Mundi.
Dominus Vobiscum, et cum Oremus. Mentes nostras et corporeas, et basilia quaestibus, Domine Domini, Celestis Atraxi, Ud no nostra sensus in nobis sedifaeus pregidia de pesus. Per Domine nostro Iesu, per esto virium tuo alma, vita et de viva de regna lentati spiritu santi. Per Domina secula secula tuo. Amen. Dominus Vobiscum, et cum Spiritu Tuo, Ite Messiae, Deo Gratias. In nomine Patris, et Spiritus Sancti. Amen. To our bishops, priests, deacons, seminarians, aspirants of the traditional Roman Catholic Church throughout the world, to our brothers in Cameroon, North Central Africa, in the Philippines, in South America, in Puerto Rico and the Caribbean, and especially here in the United States of America. We greet you in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ with apostolic blessings. On this 15th day after Pentecost, our Lord speaks of death, and death is a reality. He also shows compassion to a woman who is a widow and her son is now dead. Because of our Lord's compassion, he lifts the burden of this widow who is without husband and raises the son of Nain. As is spoken in our homily by Monsignor Lane Jackson, even when we are in our own spiritual darkness, the Lord raises us up. I encourage you, my brothers and sisters in the traditional Roman Catholic Church throughout the world, be encouraged, be lifted up in the spirit of Jesus Christ, who is the way, the truth, and the life. This month, 
here in the Metropolitan Sea and throughout the world. We celebrate Mission Month. And in this month, we deal with local missions, national missions, international missions, and especially those within our own homes and in our community. Those who are hungry, those who are suffering, maybe because of their own fault, or maybe not because of their own fault. It is the duty of the church as commanded by our master, Jesus Christ. When I was hungry, you fed me. When I was thirsty, you gave me to drink. When I was without home, you gave me a place. When I was in prison, you visited me. Well, Lord, when did we do all these things? And Jesus said, when you have done this to the least of these, my brethren, you have done it unto me. It is the duty of the church in this time to do social and corporal works of mercy. It is the extension of the holy sacrifice of the mass that God's people go throughout the world. Those who are sick, those who are in need, those who seriously need help and to help them with our own resources. For if we have two coats, let us give one to someone who doesn't. In this mission month, we pray for our mission churches throughout the world, that you will become solvent and will become parishes, not because of numbers or finances, but for the glory of God. We pray for the bishops, the priests, and the deacons who work very hard, and for the religious women and men who continue to pray and work in the vineyard <coughs> of the Lord. Let us here at the Metropolitan Sea always acknowledge that it is in our social work that God's people are drawn even the nearer to him. It is not enough to come to the holy sacrifice of the mass and receive Jesus in the blessed sacrament. But it is when we go out to the hedges and the highways and help those who are in need first by feeding. For no one can hear the gospel if they are hungry. We need to feed them. Mother Teresa of Calcutta always in India fed those who were hungry. There are those who have many diseases in North Central Africa, in South America, in the Philippines, and all throughout the world, even here in the United States. Let us pray for our seniors who have worked very hard in this country, here in the United States of America. And now there's the talk of the voucher system. There's the talk of so many things. And for those of us here in the United States, the climate now is so confused and so mixed up that we are now at the threshold of voting in November. And my God, we don't know who to vote for. We have those who uphold abortion, euthanasia, same-sex marriage, pedophilia. We have those who do not care for the poor, those who uphold even companionship. We have those who do not care, and yet we are on the threshold of a new time for a new president. My prayer is for every Catholic that you observe 
what our Lord Jesus Christ teaches. The natural law and the divine law must be upheld. We cannot compromise the faith. Whether the president is black or white or any other nationality, it's not about the nationality. It is about the natural law and the divine law. God gave Ten Commandments. The United States of America was built on God. The fathers believed in God. And yet, we have a Mormon president. We have even a president who will uphold these immoral beliefs. And yet, there are many Catholics who will compromise even their faith. Pope Leo the 13th, Pius the 12th, and all of the fathers of the church have always upheld the truth. Jesus is the truth. And so I do not try to persuade legislation, but as a bishop of the church, it is my duty to feed the flock entrusted to my care and to protect the flock from wolves in sheep clothing. I pray that your conscience will not be seared with a hot iron that when you go and vote that you will think hard as St. Paul warns us in Romans 131, not only those who do evil, but those who join with evil. And so, if we have a president, his wife, the vice president, who is a Catholic, what the whole uphold those immoral teachings then what do we have left? We are living in dangerous times, perilous times, such as the world has not seen before. And our Lord is challenging us to face this new order. In the end, will our Lord say to us, I never knew you, depart from me a worker of iniquity. And yet, the bishops are saying, many of the liberal bishops, yes, theologically, we speak of two evils. Yes, theologically, we speak of the lesser and the greater evil. But evil is evil. And yet, we still must make a choice. May the Holy Spirit guide us in these times of so much confusion in our nation and throughout the world. I speak to the President of South America, whom I've had the opportunity to write and to receive letters to the Congresswoman in South America, I speak to those who are suffering from so many things, prostitution, bad water, sewage, problems all over the country. That in some way, you will be able to help the poor and consider their plight. Amen. Amen.
Dominus vobiscum. Et a spiritus tua. Sit nomini domini benedictum. Agitorium nostrum in nomini domini. Benedicat vos omnipotens Deus, Pater et Filius et Spiritus Sancti. Amen.